Conversations with Ed Marshall is underwritten by Delgado Community College, Port of Plaquemines, Private First Class Driving Academy, and a special thanks to United Way. Award-winning broadcast journalist Ed Marshall asks the tough questions you want answered. Informative, soul-stirring, one-on-one interviews about matters that affect our lives in this region we call home. Here now with Conversations is Ed Marshall. Well, hello and welcome. In America, more than 640,000 people return to their communities from prison each year. On the first one to three years, however, three-fourths of them are rearrested and back incarcerated. Well, some agencies, uh, in cooperation with the United Way, have developed a program which appears to have keeping people that were incarcerated out of prison and doing well. Let's take a look at this tape, and you'll see why. The Louisiana Prisoner Reentry Initiative serves as a model and a framework to help improve public safety. Life can be difficult. It can always present you with circumstances that are challenging to navigate. So imagine if on top of that you have a record and you've been released from prison and you're trying to navigate housing, and your food needs, and transportation to get to and from appointments, and all the responsibilities that go, on, go along with being a formerly incarcerated individual. And so a continuum of care allows us to carefully help an individual navigate all those challenges and issues and ensure they have the best possible chance of success. We pretty much meet with them while they're incarcerated, get all the information that we need. You know, some people don't have housing when they, when they get home. Some people don't need a job or a car or phones or clothes even more, right? So we get all that information for them and then we go to the office and we talk about how can we help them. We have to give them a second chance. And so these type of programs allow for them to come home and blend into the communities and just be industrious people. And I think that's what they want and the Department of Corrections believe that they could. And so I'm happy to be a part of this and happy to have been the, the actual catalyst for this in Jefferson Parish. You know, in 26 years that I spent as a prosecutor here in, in Jefferson Parish, it became very clear to me that the number of people that you put in jail or the length of the sentences was not the most important thing that we accomplished. Coming up with a program to bring these people who are ultimately going to be released from jail back into society in a way that they can become active and productive members of society is much more important. What we're really focused on is moderate to high risk. Moderate to high risk individuals because they are the ones that statistically have been shown to need more services, need more help and hands to, uh, to get past the barriers that they may receive when it's time for them to be released. Whatever their needs are, um, case management goes through their needs if they need legal, we team up with a legal team. If they need mental health services, we, we um, team up with a mental health services. We're their right hand and walk them through, literally walk them through this process of trying to better themselves, get back on their feet. I believe that uh, it's far easier to rehabilitate people than to just send them to jail. If we can help them when they first get out of jail, uh, find places to live, help them get trained for jobs, and help them address the problems that led them to incarceration to begin with, such as addictions, anger management, all of these things play into whether they succeed or fail. And the fact of the matter is that the money we spend on them now is very small compared to what we're going to spend on them when they are rearrested and sent to jail for increasingly longer sentences. They are, uh, have paid their debt, so it's uh, our job, along with theirs, to ensure that they can become productive, successful citizens. The program through United Way will have spent countless hours with those formerly incarcerated persons and uh, coach them, provide them with all the necessities that they need to just come back and avoid recidivism. Since we started the program, you know, we've had no recidivism amongst the clients that we work with. So, I think that's a testament. I mean, the whole idea is to help individuals get out of prison, get on with their lives and not go back. And that revolving door that existed before 
is just traumatized families in a way that's just not, not acceptable. It's not good for the families and it's not good for the community they live in. We help as much as we can to get them back on their feet so they won't have to go back to jail. Well, joining me in the studio now, Jefferson Parish Councilman Byron Lee, who's no stranger to us, and also my fraternity brother, I like to say that. Uh, he's part of that uh, program and uh, the local efforts to get uh, people back on track. Welcome. Good Thank to see you, you so again. Thank you so much. Congratulations on your uh, re-election, by the way. Oh, appreciate you know, it. Appreciate uh, it. You're in Jefferson Parish doing a, a really great job. And I don't just say that because you're an alpha man. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> but, but tell our audience, uh, you know, you were the catalyst for this. Tell me why did you think it was so important to do it? Well, uh, in our communities, uh, there are people who go astray. Mm -hmm. And they pay their debt to society. And they deserve second chances. They deserve an opportunity to come back and live the American dream. Uh, some of the things that, that they were um, uh, prosecuted for, uh, and at that age they may have been young, but they're not necessarily the same people. And so we should not, I felt that their motives should not be questioned. I believe that, every, that there should be opportunities for those who want to come back, be a part of society and, and, and want to become uh, someone who people can be proud of and so my commitment uh, is while doing this council tenure but also doing my first eight years on the council was to support those type of programs that help to uh, bring back the formerly incarcerated and, and make them uh, just good people in our community who, who we'd be proud of even if we didn't know they went had been incarcerated. Gotcha. So this also uh, has a lot to do with their, with their families too, their children when they come back and, and getting a job and those kinds of things. So knowing all that, that's when you got with uh, the United Way and that kind of thing and say, look, let's try to develop this and, and make it work? Yes, yes. Uh, United Way contacted me and they wanted to meet. And um, we, we had a very good meeting and, and what they were looking to do made all the sense in the world to me. And so, again, as a part of my commitment, uh, when there's opportunity to work with people who have the same mission, the same goals, then I chose to do so. And fortunately, I was also able to convince some of my colleagues to do the same. And uh, what they're doing is a wonderful program uh, for our formerly incarcerated, and, and they're making us look good. They're making our community look good in their efforts to be able to provide case management services to get them uh, uh, twit cards if they need a driver's license if they need it, and all those modern things that maybe they missed out while, while being incarcerated. And so they're doing a wonderful job to integrate them back into society and uh, get them to working. And as you know, there's a lot of jobs out here right now right, right. that people have not been able to fill. And so we have that population that maybe some of those guys or ladies uh, may be prepared to do. Because particularly you know, over at Delgado, they, they have a whole area where, where everything is about uh, retooling and, you know, just getting getting on a job, you know, working those jobs like right. uh, manufacturing, uh, uh, welding, and all those kinds of things, which bring in good money and those people. And it, it's having, I gather, the, the job, too, that kind of keeps them solid where you don't see a lot of them returning. In that video, you said you all have had, had, had nobody uh, uh, end up back in, in, in jail. That's amazing. That's right. That's right. And, and, and uh, it's, it, it's working. And so we have to always do what works. And, and so if you, if you have the opportunity to analyze a problem and then put resources behind that analyzation, then you will see these type of success stories. And, that, and that's what you see. 
we're going to wrap up with you in just a second, but uh, you have the last word. For people out there who are, who are skeptical about this, what do you say to them this, you know, uh, about people having a second chance? Well, number one, it's important for people to come back and bond with their families. It's important for them to integrate in society because they will not be a part of society's problems. And so, and then that's one aspect, the social aspect, but also the employment aspect. A lot of people come home with a lot of real good skills. And in this society, uh, you can become very successful without having a college degree. Ask many of Bill Gates and many of them who've started tech companies. Many of those who are coming on have tech skills as well. And so as we're looking at opportunities, we have to look at that population and just say, well, we don't even want to talk about the fact that they were incarcerated. We want to talk about the skill sets that they have. Yeah. And so I think, as I always say, working together works. And I believe that we have an opportunity to take some very good people and uh, have them uh, become beacons of light. And then they'll go back and they'll talk to, uh, they'll reach out to others who may be coming home. Right. And they'll be able to say, here are the things you need to know. Here are the things that you can do so that that, that belief system is, is, is greater than not. Yeah. And so I believe that with they, with they having a, a great belief system, I believe the community benefits from that. Employers benefit from that. And so overall, I think it's just a good thing. Fantastic. Come back and see us again. We're we'll going to follow you all in the program and, and uh, maybe in about six months to a year, come back and, and let us know how it's going. Would you do that for us? Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. Good seeing you again. Thank you. All righty. Thank you. When we come back, we're going to have more on what to do with people who are trying to re-enter society after being incarcerated. So stay with us. Everybody in my house knows how to ride a bike except me. People ask. I, your children, learned how to ride a bike, and you didn't. I didn't teach them. I just created an environment where they taught themselves, and all I had to do was be there. Several years ago, I had an opportunity to work with a group that, that deals with re-entry of, of people who have been incarcerated uh, called Harvest the Equity, and uh, it's been spearheaded by... Uh, the black men of labor, and I have the CFO of that of that uh, organization with me, Mr. Mr. Todd Higgins. Todd, good to see you again. Same here. How you doing? Good, good. I, I actually went out with you all on, on some of the projects that that you had. Tell us how, how this 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 started. I, I think it was right after Katrina. Yeah, right after Katrina, Ed, uh, there was a large need for uh, workers here in New Orleans to clean up the city uh, through recovery, and most of the guys. Uh, uh, most of the people in New Orleans weren't here, so a lot of guys were being released from prison and uh, needed jobs, but a lot of the contractors, federal contractors or state contractors, wouldn't want to hire them. And uh, Resource One, an uh, engineering firm that is owned by one of the members of the Black Men of Labor, uh, decided to partner with the Black Men of Labor to have these guys work and do some of the cleaning up of the city. And it just propelled to something that was great for the city because it allowed locals to have jobs, good paying jobs, and the money was staying in the community. And uh, from there, we decided to design it and uh, present it to uh, Mayor Landrew back in 2015. And he hesitated and took it and ran the rest of the yards with it. Yeah, I saw it. there was a picture of him even being out there uh, assisting it and meeting, meeting the folks out there. Yeah, he came on, on several projects that we did. He came out to the sites just to see what was going on because as the mayor and leadership of the city, we wanted him to have a perspective of what was going on. We wanted him to know that the value uh, the dollars that were spent in the uh, contract was being utilized correctly. And uh, so we invited him and along with other council people to come out to see from time to time. And, you know, the elected officials uh, did come out. He came out several times, you know, and, and also rose up his sleeve to work with the guys. So, and that made the guys, the clients in the program, know that they had a partner in the city because here was the mayor being with them. Yeah. And, and people say, what was the success of that program? I think part of that success is sitting next to you, right? Yeah, part of that success is uh, <laughs> Tyrone Yancey and, yeah. and other members who came through. I mean, we had, uh, from 2015 to 2019, 835 guys who came through the program uh, who were formerly incarcerated either through the Department of Justice or uh, Louisiana State Penitentiary. And those guys were, uh, out of that 835, nobody recidivized yeah. as of today. 
So Carl, it's a good thing. I met you. <clears throat> I, I met you through Todd. And uh, man, you are a hard working guy. And um, you know, and, and at that point, I had no idea that you know about about a harvest equity. Um, and uh, just tell us how that the program changed your life. Well, really, the um, the program consists of two people over it that that kind of like I grew up around one from a young age, mm -hmm. Fred, and uh, Fred and Todd were real real close. And I developed a relationship with Todd. Along with that, they presented to me the program of what they was doing, and I had interest in it because every time I tried to get a job, it would always be a thing of my background check would make me not be able to fulfill that task of, of, of working. So they gave me an opportunity to work. I wanted to work. Uh, I didn't want to go back to any of what I used to do so with the help of them and my drive upon wanting to, you know, have success, live different, I pushed hard and I just stayed with it. And I'm, and I'm sure you've told other people about it who have also gotten their lives together. Well, they come to me at the time of me being in a federal uh, halfway house. Mm -hmm. So me being in a federal halfway house, I was uh, in there with a whole bunch of guys that were coming home. So as I uh, into the, the, the program, I would kind of like tell them of the things that I was going through and dealing with, and they wanted to, to be a part of it, and I presented it to Todd. And Todd came over to the halfway house and sat down with the director and the administrator, um, and, and they formed That's something to where we was able to get a lot <laughs> of guys out and work. That's great. So Todd, tell us what, what what's the, the the rate of a return of investment for the city uh, has been with with uh, you know helping to to get these young people out and, and and jobs. Well, we looked at it from an economical standpoint. Ed is to say that for every five dollars the city gave to the program, they received four dollars back because most of these men and women, once they were released from uh, incarceration, had to have housing. Uh, and with housing came electric, water, and groceries. Mm -hmm. So by them having a job uh, locally, uh, it allowed them to have housing. Yeah. It allowed them to pay their rents, which paid taxes to the city, it allowed grocery taxes. And the unique part about it all was that we all know the saying that a dollar in the black community don't last no more than 10 seconds. Well, with this program, that money stayed in the black community a lot Turn longer. Over. Turnover because right. these men and women not only felt that they, uh, owed the community that they somewhat kind of destroyed with the drugs or whatever they were doing, they felt that they could put not only sweat equity but stay back in those communities. So it kind of made the community look different because with Tyrone being uh, from the Desire Housing Project, when we went in those neighborhoods, the people knew of his history, they knew his family, they knew him, and it was allowed for him to talk to young men and women who were going astray right, to get right. in a better way. So the program wasn't just about uh, a workforce for the city of New Orleans, it was more about we were able to mentor and teach young men and women who didn't have that mentor who had that experience as Tyrone had right. because And so they know when they saw him. Yeah. He he was talking the real stuff. Real stuff. I mean he that, can it that's was that's why this program yeah, was talking it, about. It, it's the difference between having a person come to you from a social worker or some kind of educational format. Mm -hmm. He had to educate me that though I was educated, uh the prison life education was different. Yeah. So the way I was talking to some of the men and women, they were interested in hearing it, but it was kind of over their head. But so he would break it down for them, and then he would come back to me and report, and we would put something together for that. So, well, I hope you got a chance to to to, to work with the, the new administration with this, and uh, also if people want to get in touch with you about the program, tell us how they do that. Uh, they can email us at info at the bmol. That's uh, i n f o at t h e b m o l dot org. Uh, they can call 504-233-4153. Okay. Well, I look forward to hearing back from you all. And uh, Mr. Yancey, so good to know you. Yes. You're, you're a fantastic guy. I got a chance out. Yeah, I mean, you were moving those other people along like, hey, y'all got to stick with me and get this done. I yeah. like that. Go in <laughs> and get it done. Okay. Yeah. I appreciate both of y'all coming in. Thank you, good. And Ed. we'll be in touch. we Will do. All right. When we come back. We're going to talk to a man that came all the way down from Memphis uh, and, uh, to tell us about a program that they're, they're doing there. Uh, you may see one of his folks uh, on the highway. Uh, 
I'll tease you with that. So stay here. My biggest fear in the middle of my addiction was that I would never be able to get over it and that my kids wouldn't have a father. I started thinking, you know what? This isn't my story. For the longest time, fear held me back from ultimately being who I wanted to. I had to become a better man to be a better father. It's important to me that my kids are empowered and truly believe that if, if they can think it, they can do it. Well, this is our, our, our last segment uh, for this show, and I have the, uh, the, the wonderful honor of, of having Mr. Elder David Jemison in, in with us, all the way from Memphis, Tennessee, by the way. Uh, he heard about our, the program that I was doing, and uh, we reached out to each other, and he drove in, and we're glad to have you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Glad to be here. Unlike our other guests, uh, uh, you uh, helped with recidivism uh, through a, a different uh, mechanism, as I say, uh, basically through your, your trucking program. You've been in trucking about 20-something years, and uh, you started getting a lot of uh, people who had, who had, you know, trying to re-enter society, knocking on your door saying, uh, can I learn how to drive an 18-wheeler? Tell us about that. Yes, uh, we had so many uh, people that was uh, getting out of jail and knocking on doors trying to drive this uh, semi, this tractor trailer, and being turned down left and right. And so what I did, simply to be honest with you, just got on the phone mm -hmm. and started to network. I must have called 20 people, 20 to 30 companies, and they were saying left and right, no, no, if they are a convicted felon, mm -hmm. we can't help them. But I kept trying. I reached maybe 50 calls. People started to say, yes, we will give them a job if you train them. Well, I kept calling more <laughs> until I got my job placement list up to about 60 names. At that point, I was pretty content. I was pretty happy with the success. Now, most schools, they tell the students, you can drive that tractor trailer, but you cannot have these three charges. One is a murder rap. Two is theft. Three is sexual predator. If you got anything else, we will hire you. Well, I wasn't happy with that because my thing is if you did your time, you shouldn't have a cloud over your head. Give people a chance. And so I got a program that not only can help convicted felon, but convicted felons of any charge. Out of the hmm. 4,500, I'm happy to say that we have helped probably about 2,300 were convicted felons. Wow. Out of those 2,300, probably about 190 had the worst charges. Remember, murder rap, <laughs> theft, and sexual predators. Why I haven't helped more with those worst charges? They haven't come to me. Wow. Which sh there's such a, please let me say this, there's such a tremendous shortage for drivers, company drivers, owner operators, uh, period. I mean, we're short um, nationally, globally, probably about a million drivers. Wow. Tremendous need for drivers. And I would assume now after, after uh, uh, the coronavirus is going to be even more. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. The need is there, but we see people all the time um, with that I can't mentality. You know, it's too big. I can't do this. And I tell them about the little uh, train that was going up the hill. Mm. I can't, I can't, <laughs> I can't, I can't. When they start to go down the hill, I can't, I can't. In other words, we just don't teach um, this 
uh, trade or this uh, skill, how to drive this tractor yeah. trailer. We have life lessons. Well, let's talk about that, life lessons. So what, what do you tell them in life lessons? We teach them how to be a human being. We teach them how to walk, how to talk. Uh, on military. Basically, you start from <laughs> yes, up. Yes, on military. Mm -hmm. And so I'm often uh, called the drill sergeant, and uh, I get in there, I, I get close to these guys mm -hmm. because um, it's a passion. It's like a ministry to me. Right. If Plus, you, you don't want, I mean, somebody who's been through that uh, to also reflect on, on you and your, and your company as well and on themselves. So uh, I'm sure that, 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 uh, that's a task. Yes, absolutely. But we teach uh, people, and I love to say that we teach people not just to how to uh, drive this truck, how to be successful at a great career, because it is a great career, but we also to teach how to just be the best person that you can be, not in the light, mm -hmm. because it's easy to live in a light, and you're on this platform, or you got this status, you got this power, but it's more important uh, to teach, and that's what we do, what you do in the dark. Yeah. That's when nobody's looking at you. That's right. So, so we, we only have about another minute. I do want to say, ask, ask us, how, so, so how, how is, you all do about seven to 12 students so you can be more hands-on, you know, when you do your courses, you keep it small? Yes, yes, that's absolutely. Right. And we do you all keep up with, uh, you know, where they are now and that kind of thing? Good question. You know, at first I used to get a little down because, you know, you, you help so many people and the ones that actually keep in touch probably about 10%. That yeah. used to give me a little yeah. down, but then I started to really think about it. Those are the ones that really, yeah. really love you and, 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 and want to stay close to you. Yeah. And because the crowd we get it twisted yeah. you know the crowd really not for you right. all you need is a few good people right. on your side speaking of a few good people you've got a new book out uh it's called preaching through the turbulence uh and it's on amazon and uh i, I it's a really good read so i, I recommend it to people it, it's a super read uh talking about just you know everybody's a preacher in some form or fashion and uh, you know somebody wants to get their hands on it uh, do so because uh it, it really is something that's been, that's a, a real blessing. Thank so you. I appreciate you coming. Uh, do come back, and I'll try to get to Memphis and see you, and maybe uh, take me up in one of those big rigs. Okay? And we're going to go down on Beale Street. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, I'd love to get in one of those big rigs and see how, how they work. So, look, thanks for being with us, and do come back and see us again. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. That's going to do it for Conversations for this month. Until next month, take care of yourself and do something good for someone else and do something good for yourself. God bless. We'll see you. Conversations with Ed Marshall is underwritten by Delgado Community College, Port of Plaquemines, Private First Class Driving Academy, and a special thanks to United Way.